right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started here today. Uh, thank you all for coming out to Heritage on this rainy Thursday morning. Um, we have some very big topics to cover in today's program, some weighty topics from 5G in China to the future of digital infrastructure and the Five Eyes Alliance, which uh, joins Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US uh, in an arrangement for sharing sensitive intelligence. We have an expert panel ahead to, to discuss these issues, but first we have a special keynote speaker, Congressman Mike Rogers, uh, former congressman from Michigan who chaired the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence from 2011 to 2015, where he oversaw a budget of $70 billion, which funded the nation's 17 intelligence agencies. Notably, he led a bipartisan investigation into Chinese telecoms firm Huawei and a congressional report issued in 2012, a declassified version of which you can, you can see. Before that, he served as an Army officer uh, and an as FBI field special agent in Chicago. Today, Mr. Rogers serves as the vice chairman of the board at Mitre Corporation and as a director at leading companies, including Cyberspons, IAP, and 4IQ. He is a senior fellow at Harvard University and at the David Abshire Chair at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. I am a uh, longtime admirer of, of, of Representative Rogers. He consistently, in his time in office, uh, put country ahead of personal and partisan interests, and I think uh, led a uh, bipartisan environment in which real progress was made and real work was done on the Intelligence Committee. So I'm very pleased to have him come and speak about a topic he's been uh, studying intimately now for over a decade. With that, please extend a warm welcome, Congressman Mike Rogers. Well, good morning. Thanks for being here on one of the probably most important national security issues facing the United States that nobody's really paying attention to. Uh, and so I'm glad that there's at least some dialogue uh, on this very, very important topic. If you think about 5G and what it's going to do uh, across the country, just it's going to be transformational. So think about going from a garden hose with a, with a weak pump to a fire hose. Uh, and that's really the dynamic change that we're going to see with 5G. So have less latency, more efficiency, and much more uh, capacity and capability. And it's coming uh, slowly, I think, to the United States. It's going to be a little bit of a slow rollout. It'll probably be in denser urban areas. It'll have a high degree of commercial impact first. Companies that uh, will need that extra capacity to do the kind of uh, productivity building that they need in the production of their materials and services will get it first. Uh, and then the rest of us will slowly plug in uh, to it. So you think about a, going from one gigabit a second to about 10 gigabits a second, meaning that what would take you an hour to download in a big file can happen in just a matter of minutes. So huge, huge, huge implications for the positive and for the good, not only here but around the world. But with that comes some serious uh, security challenges. And so if you look at uh, the companies that are competing in the 5G space, uh, enterprises that are trying to get ahead of the curve in the build out worries me a lot, and I'll tell you why. So the FBI just indicted uh, Huawei not that long ago up in New York, uh, and they talked about the bad behavior of a company that has a, candidly, a bad reputation ethically around the world uh, today. Everything from using cash payments to gain contracts, uh, to intellectual property theft. In that particular case, they highlighted uh, money laundering schemes. Uh, in addition, they uncovered some pretty interesting things, including bonuses paid to employees who provided intellectual property from other companies. So think of the ethics of that. So let's just back off for a minute in the notion that it's even connected uh, to the Chinese government and intelligence and defense services. Would you really want to engage where Americans go through ethics training? Every, every company that uh, you just talked about, uh, I go through ethics training as a board member. Our employees go through ethics training to make sure that we don't commit uh, va uh, uh, violations of US law, including international trade norms 
uh, et cetera, right? No, no bribing for contracts. It's illegal. And we would not deal for the sheer reputation of our companies with companies who had that high degree of ethical challenges. So I don't know how Europe's going to try to uh, kind of right size that in, in their new push for ethical behavior in places like Africa and the Middle East and other things. Uh, and that's just one episode of what they're trying to do. Both Huawei and ZTE uh, are trying to set standards. They're on, I think, five different standards bodies for, for, for what 5G looks like. And so what does that mean? They're trying to influence what those standards are to comport with what they believe is their strength in the market. And they're not even bashful about it. They'll tell you they're going to do it, and then they'll do it. And we stand by, I think, in many cases and scratch our head and think, wow, how did this happen? And so if you look at some of the, even the bigger violations of the last few months on the security protocols, look at the uh, China Telecom uh, about late last year, uh, diverted for about 90 days uh, internet data from Canada, North America, and, and Korea, left that area, ran it through Beijing, wasn't supposed to do that, right? I'm sure that was an accident, right? Happens to be around times when there is a high interest in trade negotiations and other things, right? And so the, the part of the problem with, the, with Huawei and ZTE is that they are, I believe, based on our report in 2012, and certainly the intelligence services reports today, it is a part or a functioning uh, subservient enterprise to Chinese intelligence uh, and defense services, their national security apparatus. And China has a law on its books that says any Chinese company uh, that has data, no matter where it was acquired, must turn it over to the state when requested. No due process, no third party adjudication, it is one state who requires that information, you will give it up. And so why does China want made in, 20, uh, made in China 2025 and data dominance in 2025? When you start thinking about what the 5G build out means and how much access to data that means, if I control the, uh, the gear that builds the 5G build out, I will control probably whatever I so desire into that gear, meaning I can get access to data anywhere in the world as much as I want. And you're already seeing through AI algorithms and other things that the Chinese are using their vast population to start collecting and understanding big data analytics. Pretty clever. And again, they're not hiding. They're telling you we're doing it. In the meantime, we're having these debates about should we or should we not uh, participate with Huawei in our 5G build out in the United States. I think we're at the right edge of that. I think the government is being very, very clear about where they want to go. Uh, Europe is a little bit hamstrung right now. They don't seem to quite get to where we are. Canada, I think, is going through this process and coming to the right conclusions. Australia said we're banning 5G from our core networks, or excuse me, Huawei from our core networks in the 5G build out. And again, why this is important, today you can protect uh, data or at least try to protect data because it's a core functioning event, right? So all the internet is a core place that goes out. So the security decisions, the management decisions, the administrative decisions happen in one place. With 5G, all of that's what's called pushed out to the edge. So every tower becomes a vulnerability. We're going to connect 25 billion, roughly, on best estimates by 2025, a new internet uh, uh, of things devices, right? Everything from HVAC, et cetera. That's a new threat platform that security folks have to worry about, 25 billion. If you want wireless, uh, excuse me, driverless cars, you need 5G. You need that increased uh, or decreased latency, increased efficiency, that 9999% accuracy uh, in the operation of a motor vehicle, right? That's just, just huge. But that also presents all of those IP addresses flying off of that car now become a security risk. And so all of that data is going to get thrown into the, a system of which the Chinese said we would like to own and build and own the equipment. And real quickly on the equipment, we can take a few questions here. I, I know you've got a little bit of a late start. Is what things that were found. So the, the Germans and I have had long discussions on, on should, should uh, Huawei be, participate in the German build out of 5G. And they said, even if, these are the security officials, even if we can get to the point where we don't believe that they're subservient to the Chinese state. 
I, I believe they are. Uh, most of the intelligence services believe they are, even in countries that are not, are saying that maybe we should find a way to let them build. Uh, he said, our biggest complaint is when we identify a vulnerability in their system, it takes up to 24 months to get it patched. So that means that Chinese uh, intelligence services are notified of a vulnerability in a system. So let's just say, let's be altruistic, and the government is not involved, and the intelligence services aren't involved in trying to get that data and even track their own citizens. But once they find out, they're not going to use those vulnerabilities to their own purposes for the next 24 months. Right? That's, that is not a standard that any American company could tolerate in the business place. We would not tolerate it. You know of the patch, you are a vulnerability, you are required to patch, right? 24 months is a lifetime in cybersecurity. So think of all the undisclosed administrative functions they found in Huawei gear, meaning uh, they say, well, it's just an administrative function that we have to patch, right? So we have to do it externally. We need to send data and retrieve data uh, internationally in order to continue to the functioning of the gear. That in and of itself is not untrue. However, they have undisclosed um, processes, administrative functions, meaning I buy, you buy my box, I forgot to tell you about this function that I use, that they tell you that they use for administrative functions, which means they could implant malware, implant surveillance mail, uh, uh, code, uh, et cetera, into those boxes. So all of that I tell you in a flurry uh, to let you know that we're at a really interesting place in the 5G build-out. The debate is happening around the world today, hopefully a little louder, thanks to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, and talking about the security risks of their gear. And I have to say, if, if I believe for a minute this was about competition and you know, a lot of people say, oh, this is about American protectionism, I almost wish that were true. But we don't have any company in America <laughs> that can actually compete with them uh, or we would be throwing business to, right? The big, the big uh, international Western players are Ericsson and Nokia. And so it's really not about that. It really is about what to what level of tolerance will we allow our data uh, to be in the hands of a government that has proven over and over and over again to use that data against its own citizens, uh, for international intellectual property theft, for disruption activities. And by the way, we've seen China intelligence services use disruption in cyber recently more than we ever have before, meaning they're going into companies and trying to break things, not just steal things, right? That's a change in policy. Imagine if they have the pipes for all of it. Good luck, right? And so everybody says, well, we think we can defend it. What other product in the world would you buy knowing, well, I'm gonna have a security risk. I'm just gonna have to figure out how I defend it better because it's $4 cheaper. Right? I just don't know any, any product you'd do that for, or you'd even tolerate it, candidly. But here we are, find ourselves in this debate. Uh, and so hopefully we can come to a better conclusion. I'm really looking forward to the, uh, the panel today and their discussion. I think it'll be very, very helpful uh, to try to flush out a lot of these issues and, and, uh, and differences of opinion maybe even on, on some of this. But with that, I'm going to close and, and try to keep you all on time uh, and see if you have any questions, comments, yeah. concerns. We have time for a question or two. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Uh, my question is: um, Is that really possible if um, we can separate our system um, for the between the civilian system and the military or security system because some some country uh, is kind of thinking that if they exclude Huawei from their core or security system uh, that may be enough so I'm just wondering how do you think about the risk yeah and I don't believe that because the whole goal to, to be a part of it so let me back up Anything for intelligence, if you're going to be in the intelligence business, the most important thing is access, access, access. Right? I need access to people that I want to try to recruit, uh, or I need access to information that is of value. I mean, the closer you can get to that, the better off you are. So if I'm operating on a network that even, isn't even part of a military network, but people around inside that military network are connecting to any other network, and today, there's no such, there's no line. You can't say this, unless you're completely cut off, you're air gapping from the internet. There is no way 
that those systems can't, you can't touch those systems. And so I argue we better get this right up front because all of these systems, it becomes an ecosystem of how the internet uh, operates and functions. And so, you know, again, some notion that you can say, well, this, this uh, open internet what, uh, it should be okay versus this it closed or a semi-closed internet uh, will be different really is not realistic. People will be bouncing between those networks. Anybody that has a, you know, a device that they take into their office right, has bounced between networks. And so that's the part that I think people fail to realize. You know, and again, I, I try to tell companies this. Uh, I, actually, I, I asked my European friends, tell me how with the Chinese law, as it states today, comports with GDPR. It does not. And yet they're willing to walk them into their markets. For, I, for what reason, you know, we can all suspect. But, I, I, you know, it doesn't comport. And so if you think the same thing for private companies in the United States, well, I'm going to try to get Huawei. And the reason they're pushing back, by the way, including big, great American telecommunications companies, is the fact that it's cheaper, much cheaper. You know, if I can steal your intellectual property and I don't have to do all the research and development to get it to that product, I can offer it a lot cheaper, right? I don't have to compete normally in the open market. That's why it's cheaper. And my argument is, are you willing to uh, expose the people who use your network uh, to the fact that their information may end up uh, into the intelligence services database in Beijing. I argue you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. And it could be a liability down the road. And it could be brand management down the road. If that comes out and you did, did it because you wanted to make an extra $4 this quarter, have you done anything good for the people who are buying that gear? I would argue not. Do we have one more question? Gene? Dean Chang, Heritage Foundation. Um, there's been some pushback in various quarters that while the U.S. has charged uh, Madame Meng, for example, it's over Iran sanctions, that uh, Huawei and T-Mobile was old-fashioned industrial espionage, but that no one has yet filed a suit or filed charges that specifically argue that Huawei engages in cyber espionage. And I'm wondering what would be your response to that? Because um, obviously there's a difference between information that is collected by law enforcement, information that's collected from the intelligence community, um, and what can be used in a court of law and what cannot. Yeah, no, and this is one of the biggest arguments and pushbacks <coughs> that you'll hear. So two things. One, I would also uh, add into that the, the uh, FBI indictment. If you read that, and I encourage everybody to read that indictment, that the, the New York Huawei indictment, pretty damning. Right, and so uh, if you're talking about Huawei engaged in saying, I'm gonna spy for the Chinese intelligence service to get X, probably not happening that we would know of. But what is happening is the fact that they're enabling the Chinese intelligence service by access and control to those networks and those routers to get access to places they probably shouldn't. And if you think about, this is really interesting. If you see the change in a human espionage, traditional uh, human intelligence targeting, the last bit, few big cases that have come out, it's pretty interesting what they were tasked to steal. They weren't tasked to steal plans for the next, you know, fill in the blank missile system or tank or airplane system. That still happened and there were cases that shown that. But what they found was they were targeting access uh, computer access. So they were trying to get credentials, inside mail lists, uh, you know, phone books, if you will, uh, email lists, names, um, anything that you could get about individuals. Why? Because once you have that information, it's much easier to target cyber penetrations into those organizations. And so what, who enables that? Well, it's, if, if you're using my gear uh, and I have built-in vulnerabilities, um, that's how they're doing it. I don't believe that Huawei, well, I, you know, I shouldn't say that. I do think Huawei has done some interesting things. There was a case in Australia where they turned over access information. It was an administrator on a system that was run by Huawei uh, uh, individual who was tasked to pick up something. Now, that, I argue that's you're part of an espionage chain if you're doing that, and gave it to the Chinese government. What was it? It was, again, 
information that would make it easier for them to penetrate certain, certain places. So Huawei didn't steal it, but they enabled the Chinese government to steal it. And this is the other one that really gets me quickly on this, piece, this point. There's something called process hollowing. So these security folks come out and say, oh, we think we can, we're gonna create a center, right, to make sure that we're secure against Huawei and ZTE gear that's going in our network. And we think we're gonna outsmart the offensive cyber people in China that are gonna use this gear. Basically, that's what they're saying. They don't use those words, but this is exactly what they're saying. And by the way, tell me what other product you wanna build your defenses so you can buy it and use it because you know it's a vulnerability. <laughs> this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. But okay, that's where they're going. I think Germany just announced they're gonna do it too. Great Britain said they're gonna do it. So they have this whole government center whose sole purpose is to try to prevent Huawei uh, from enabling espionage for their citizens. Uh, okay, I know one, one better way. <laughs> Don't have them in the first place. Uh, but this process hollowing is really interesting. And this is what we found. So even in the British report in July, uh, by their cyber center. They came out and said, oh, we think we have it, and we think within five years we'll really have it. Five years. Can you lose a lot in five years? I thought you could. Uh, so five years. Here's the problem. What they also stated in there, and no, didn't get a lot of attention, was that the equipment and the code that was sent to China for them to test was not binary equivalent to the equipment and code that was put into the networks, which means they cheated, Right? This is another example of an ethical problem. They cheated, and, the, and then the equipment that they put in the network wasn't the same. So they were using code that they didn't already pre-approve for test. I mean, it's, 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 again, the examples of this are crazy. Here's the other part of that. If I use process hollowing, so an administrative side of cyber, things that we don't see that happen all day long, even the updates that are happening to your phone, all of those administrative functions, opening files, closing files, moving data, all of that updating patches and all of that stuff that's happening all day long, right? That, that happens a ton of times. So and multiply that over every device and every system that you have that's connected externally, right? Happens and it's a legitimate function, these administrative functions. Process hollowing is you take one of those administrative functions, you hollow it out, you go in and you place malware in there, right? And then you wait. So if I run a test, and I'm going to say, I'm going to find out what those guys are doing. I run a test, I go down every administrative function, and every administrative function comes back as, yeah, that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Now, when you're not paying attention, they, uh, they have a way to go into that process, bring that malware out, do what it's supposed to do, either be destructive and burn, or in most cases, go out, do its function, and come back and hide in this process, this administrative function. And tell me how you're going to catch that. I'm in cyber, the cyber business. It would be damn near impossible to catch it unless you see it while it's actually happening. Really hard to do. Uh, and if you think about, you know, people are saying that the chip issue or Sun Microchip was debunked. I, I don't believe that. It, what I do believe is they didn't find anything. Why? That's the steroids of process hollowing. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, where the Sun Micro company that makes motherboards in China, uh, the, the intelligence services told the company, by the way, and I believe that's exactly how it happened. They walk in, by the way, you're subject to Chinese law, and they come in and say, you're going to put this chip in those motherboards, and we're really interested in these companies in the United States. Right? It's the, it, to me, it is the, um, you know, the, 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 ultimate process hollowing. That chip is doing absolutely nothing. It is dormant. It's what's called sleeping. Uh, and what it's doing is waiting for the right command to touch it, brush past it, so that it can interject and do whatever it's doing. I would argue it's probably, in this case, stealing for intelligence purposes, right? Then moving that data at a place where it can go somewhere else to do it. Now, it's only doing that very intermittently. It's not doing it all day long. It's not doing it every minute of every day. It's only doing it when they want it to happen, right? And so if you're thinking you're, it's gonna beacon back and you're gonna catch it reporting because this is what it's doing every day, if you run a test over that board, you're not gonna find that chip because it's not doing anything. Uh, and your system would be, I don't even know how you'd find it. I don't know if you saw it, it fits on the top of your finger. It's, it's a, a, almost the size of a, you know, a, a pencil lead on the end of a pencil. I don't know how you'd find it. And so this is why this big debate about supply chain management. Can you manage 
the supply build of all of this gear in any way that would give you some comfort that that's not happening. I would argue the way it's currently happening, it's not. And it's probably going to get worse. Right? And so that, that's this, this answer to that problem. That's why the, the United States knows things that they don't want to turn off. You know, we collect information. That's why I had an open part of my report and a classified part of my report. Uh, because the classified part, you just don't want to disclose to our adversaries about what we know they're up to. Because our intelligence services need those access points to be able to figure out what are you up to today. And so that's why you have this, this conundrum. Again, my biggest argument here, though, is they have violated every ethical norm of business we can find very publicly. Right? And so I don't know why they get a pass. Imagine, would you go to Enron today you know, to open it up and say, yeah, but it's pretty cheap. I'd like them to do my energy futures. Right? Not going to happen. Right? We wouldn't allow that to happen. This is exactly what we're doing with Huawei. We're walking in saying, well, yes, you've got all of these criminal problems. Uh, you've violated sanctions and violations of, of UN sanctions, by the way. Uh, we see that you've done all of these bad things. You've money laundered. You have, you've stolen intellectual property. But come on in. We're going to build a government center so that we can make sure that you're not doing more of what you've already shown us that you're willing to do, including today, right? Like I said, they, the binary equivalency issue, pretty significant. Or not patching for 24 months. I, I don't believe that's an accident. I believe that those vulnerabilities, this is what I believe, based on all my knowledge of how they operate, that they knew about those vulnerabilities. You caught them in their vulnerabilities. Thank you very much, tech guys in Germany. Uh, and they realized that in order to make sure they have the next series of vulnerabilities, they got to use the ones that they got. So. Let's put that in a giant inbox, and hopefully maybe in a couple of months they'll get to it. Because somebody's use, utilizing those vulnerabilities. And you can't track every one of them. It would be nearly impossible to do. So that's the argument for that. I do think that the FBI now has a program where they'll go to American businesses. And if you're willing to sign all their forms, we'll give you a little more up, you know, more beefed up explanation of why you should be concerned about Huawei and ZTE gear in your networks. Um, not the best way to do it. Uh, but I argue I don't know if we have any other good way to get to that same conclusion. And that's all kind of happening today. Uh, and once you lose this, by the way, let's just say we all give up and say, yeah, let, let them have it. Good luck trying to figure out a way out of this. How do you do that? It would cost trillions of dollars if all that gear is dispersed around the world. I don't know how people would go in and rip this gear. Some companies have, right, in the past because they've limited it. Then they've had to go in and rip the gear out. I mean, think of all the things that we know. And how would a reasonable, rational person come to the conclusion that that happened to everybody else? It's not going to happen to me. Remember the Nigerian prince emails we used to get? I only fell for that three times. Think of that. I mean, after a while, everybody gets the gig, right? You don't respond to the Nigerian prince emails. My argument is this is the mother of all Nigerian prince emails, right? Right in front of us. And yet we continue to say, come on in. We'll beat you at your own game. Anyway, thanks for uh, having me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having this discussion. I think it's critically important. You're on it at the, I think, a very critical time. And thanks for the heritage. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. A, uh, a great presentation from somebody who knows the subject matter very well and, and examined it at the highest levels of the U.S. government with the highest clearances. I uh, put a lot of value in what, what Congressman Rogers said today. And we are now able to follow that up with uh, an expert panel, um, not only good friends of mine, but some of the brightest minds on these issues. Um, and I've asked them to address uh, a range of questions from some fundamental issues like you know, what is 5G? Why is this emerging as a new battleground? Why, is this, why are there national security implications? Uh, to the state of the, the Five Eyes debate and how it could affect alliance coordination if Huawei is allowed into one member of this intelligence sharing network. 
Um, we've already seen some reports that suggest the U.S. would be forced to restrict uh, intelligence sharing with any partner nation that, that allowed Huawei into their 5G networks. So there's some ground level stuff and there's some quite sophisticated questions that I hope we can, we can cover today. And, and to accomplish that, I have uh, to my immediate left, uh, our senior fellow, uh, senior research fellow on Chinese political and security affairs, uh, Dean Cheng. He specializes in China's military and foreign policy, previously worked for 13 years as a senior analyst with SAIC, and before that in the Office of Technology Assessment as an analyst in the International Security and Space Program. To his left uh, is Klon Kitchen, who leads uh, tech policy here at Heritage, uh, where he is a senior fellow for technology, national security, and science policy. Prior to joining Heritage, uh, Klon was a national security advisor to a U.S. Senator and a 15-year veteran of the U.S. intelligence community. And to his left, uh, we have John Hemmings, Dr. John Hemmings, a uh, visiting scholar from the United Kingdom, uh, an adjunct fellow at CSIS, uh, currently uh, in the States for a few weeks uh, doing a project uh, with the Japan chair at CSIS. But he, he lives the remainder of the year in London, where he is the Asia Studies Director and Deputy Research Director at the Henry Jackson Society, a transatlantic think tank uh, with robust foreign policy views. Uh, John was here at Heritage a few weeks back to talk about the role of the UK in the Indo-Pacific and to cover some of these uh, cybersecurity questions, which he's been focusing on now uh, for some time and I think brings an important perspective from a U.S. ally that is, is uh, having a very contentious debate about this very subject. So I think uh, Dean is going to kick us off and then we're going to move to John and, and finish up with Klon. And I may offer some closing remarks and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. So with that, Dean, kick us off. Well, good morning and thank you all for coming on this uh, lovely bright, sunny uh, Washington uh, morning. Uh, I'm going to try and provide some context here for the rest of this discussion because there is, all you have to do is read the papers, watch, uh, you know, the news, um, read the internet to know that there's a lot of discussion about Chinese cyber activity, but too often it's almost like whack-a-mole. Um, look, here's some place that got hacked by the Chinese. Look, here's a uh, threat um, that's emerging. And let me suggest here that it's important to understand how the Chinese think about information in order to place these various events into context. So I'm going to uh, lay out a couple of key concepts here. The first is comprehensive national power. This is how the Chinese think about themselves and all the various other countries, how they rack and stack. It is partly an issue of how do you compare countries as diverse as Brazil, uh, the United States, um, Kenya, China. And feeding into comprehensive national power are such important elements as military power, national security, national self-defense, economic power or economic capacity, the potential that supports the actual, um, political unity, uh, is the country unified, diplomatic recognition, does anyone else care what you think, science and technology capacity. Um, because you don't want to simply make other people's washing machines and t-shirts. You would ideally like them to run your operating systems. Um, you want to have the ability to deploy your own space systems. Even cultural security. Do other people, in a sense, want to be like you? Elemental to every element of comprehensive national power, as the Chinese now envision it, is information. Because we now live, in the Chinese view, in the information age. We have transitioned out of the industrial age. And why this matters is because the currency of national power has now evolved. When we lived in the industrial age, the most important things were often physical. How many tons of bauxite have you smelted to produce aluminum? How many ships did you produce last year, whether it's warships or tankers or container ships? How many airplanes? It's not that those things don't matter anymore, but rather the most important thing in the information age is the ability to generate, to transmit, to analyze, very important part, and to exploit information more rapidly and more accurately than other countries, 
namely your adversaries. Second of all is China's self-conception. Um, for those of you who are a little bit familiar with physics, uh, let me note here, I'm not a physicist. Um, there is a concept called um, Schrodinger's cat, which is basically you put a cat in a box and there's a little um, uh, uh, container of poison gas. Let me note here, the SPCA has approved this speech. No animals have actually been harmed in the course of writing this, um, which has a 50% chance of going off and killing the cat in the box. The question is, is the cat alive or dead? You have to open the box in order to see. So in a sense, the cat is half alive and half dead. What does this have to do with China? China is simultaneously a developing country and a developed country. So on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, China is a developing country. And China should not be expected to abide by such things as absolute IP rules or greenhouse gas emission constraints upon developed countries because if you look at their GDP per capita, it's quite low. Mm -hmm. However, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and alternating Sundays, it's a fully developed country. And therefore, it sits on the UN Permanent Five. It has veto power. It sits on major international organizations. As important, it sits at the head of them. And it expects to have a say in the establishment of global norms and standards. Um, for Xi Jinping, the current Chinese leader, but also his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, the PRC right now is more developing than developed. And so she has laid out the objective that it will be a mid-level country by the 2030s, uh, arguably measured in terms of GDP per capita. And by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, it will be a developed country. It will be a comparable state to the United States or Great Britain or Germany or Japan. Again, the key to achieving this is through information, access, exploitation, analysis, and generation. So within this context of global broad strategic ends, we then see that China has a distinct interest in the internet. Both the physical aspects, servers, routers, cables, fiber optic, et cetera, but also governance. So for example, we have the Internet Corporation for the Assignment of Names and Numbers, ICANN. This is the entity that basically helps manage the Internet. Who gets a suffix, right, dot .cn, dot, uh, .ca, dot .tw, um, versus the United Nations International Telecommunications Union. The reason why ICANN matters is because ICANN subscribes to a multi-stakeholder approach. So who has a say in who gets a prefix or who gets what kind of internet address? Everybody. Corporations, religious organizations, NGOs, governments. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, this is not a very positive approach. China supports the idea of the ITU, the United Nations International Telecommunications Union, managing the internet because only nations sit on the ITU. What's the golden rule? Them who's got the gold makes the rules. In the Chinese case, the objective here is if they can help establish how the internet is governed, a whole lot of things become easier, in part because it's not just about the internet, it's about politics. Why in the world should Taiwan have its own suffix? It should be perfectly capable of operating with .cm because it's part of China. At least that's the Chinese position. Let me note here that does not necessarily reflect the position of the speaker. Um, the ITU is currently headed by a Chinese official who, in interviews before he assumed that position, openly talked about the fact that he was very much in disagreement with current internet governance standards. Beneath, the I, beneath ICANN are regional internet registries um, for the Asia Pacific, including China. That's the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. And beneath that are national internet registries. The Chinese very strongly try to direct not only themselves but other players to go through the Chinese National Internet Registry rather than APNIC, the Asia Pacific one, because again, that allows the Chinese to have more of a say as well as better visibility into who is getting an internet address. So that's governance. 
Border gateway protocols. You heard uh, Representative Rogers talk about um, redirection. So what has been found by two professors, uh, Professor Chris Demchak at the U.S. Naval uh, War College and Yuval Shavit of Tel Aviv University, is that China has been openly redirecting entire swaths of internet traffic into China. So again, some of, you know, I would like to govern how the internet is run, but if I can't do that, maybe I'll simply redirect, like a train switch or a, a lock on a canal, traffic into China. Um, how does it do this? China Telecom, one of the key major uh, core entities that helps manage the global internet, has multiple points of presence in North America. It can basically issue out, hey, we have you know, relatively less traffic over here because the internet, when you send an email from right here at the Heritage Foundation, let's say to Los Angeles, it might go by way of Chicago and across the US, or if it's less traffic, if it's faster, it might go across the Atlantic to London, to the, say Saudi Arabia, to India, to Japan, to the United States. It may sound illogical, but depending on time of day and other things, it, basically, there are beacons, if you will, saying, hey, this is a little you know, faster. What China Telecom's points of presence were doing was saying, hey, we're way faster. So, send, so all your data come on through here, and then got shunted across the Pacific into China, where it disappears into a black box, and then comes back out the other side, and eventually winds up. So nobody's saying that it disappeared, but it went into China for what purpose? It could just be, you know, sort of they were bored, um, or it could be that they were recording it and examining it. We don't know. But that is a very major problem because that's not what you're supposed to do with data. You are supposed to simply move it as rapidly as possible. And by the way, this has since been independently confirmed by Oracle Corporation. Um, which then brings us to Huawei and 5G. So what we see is internet governance issues, we see broad backbone issues, and then we see individual companies engaging in the production of the next generation of equipment. And I'm not going to go into the, any of the technical details, in part because frankly, I'm not sure I'm qualified at all to even be on this panel, but I will just note the following comparison because that's what I do, I'm poli-sci. Um, imagine that you have gone in for a blood transfusion and it turns out that you were accidentally given blood that had hepatitis B and the doctors find out. What they cannot do after diagnosing this is to pull all of the hepatitis B contaminated blood out of your system. It's not like they can go through and look at every individual corpus. Oh, that one's bad, we'll pull that. The problem with the internet as it currently functions is that as we saw with BGP uh, violation, border gateway protocol violations, information transits across the global physical infrastructure. You don't actually get to pick and choose which pieces you transmit over. You can try and pull things or push things, but if your country is a fundamental part of that backbone, if your infrastructure, and that backbone is itself vulnerable or contaminated, it's not at all clear how you would avoid that. So if you had chips, if you had servers and routers that were recording or redirecting or introducing malware or otherwise contaminating the flow, it's not clear once you hit a tipping point of X percentage of the global physical infrastructure that you can even avoid being contaminated. And what I would suggest is therefore that to a large extent, Huawei and ZTE pose the interesting challenge of the equivalent of an informational pandemic, right? I mean, we talk about malware and viruses, is the potential ability to introduce or otherwise severely adversely affect global information, transmission, and exploitation. Thank you very much. John. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say thank you actually to Jeff Smith, my friend here, and uh, all my friends here at Heritage for having me here to speak. Um, similarly, I come at this uh, as an alliances guy rather than as a 
technical expert or someone who has an engineering or coding background. My short route into this was from 2016, when China became, in very swift order, one of the largest foreign direct investors internationally and uh, spiked a large amount of investment into the advanced economies, particularly that in Europe. And you saw a lot of that investment uh, go into very strategic sectors, for example, infrastructure, critical national infrastructure, digital infrastructure, and of course, the technologies of tomorrow. And so there was a kind of a, a bit of a wake up call. Uh, I was chatting with someone earlier who uh, mentioned the German reaction to KUKA being sold. Uh, I was brought into the debate over Hinckley Point and was astonished to see a British prime minister essentially fold under both the pressure of China, diplomatic, economic, using very coercive means um, by using British, uh, British newspapers and also uh, British economic interests to push her to not do a security review over a very sensitive part of our infrastructure. And she almost lost. And that was kind of a wake-up call. You know, whatever happened to no domestic interference? So it's a new age has dawned upon us in which technology, uh, interference, and political, um, I suppose, leveraging a part of Western allies has become a kind of dominant theme in Chinese foreign policy. And I think it's one that we have to wake up to. Um, so I come to this from that. And to some extent, I think there's a very important role for think tanks to play in this um, because it's a complex issue. It's one around which there's very, very urgent sense of timing, particularly coming from uh, the carriers. A lot of the companies want to push to 5G as quickly as possible. Uh, damn, you know, fire the deport torpedoes and damn the results. Um, and we're not even sure of all the social uh, effects of 5G, much less. So take 5G, as um, was mentioned earlier by Representative Rogers, and of course, as we've seen by uh, Brigadier General uh, Robert Spaulding, so 5G itself is going to complicate life. So then add in a malign actor who's building the 5G. So it's both of those, I think, are bringing us to the point where think tanks in the West who are going to defend the values and the principles of the republic or parliamentary democracy need to have these debates very urgently. Um, in the UK, there's very few people talking about it, to my astonishment, which is another reason I'm in front of you. So very few people, aside from the government or from the occasional um, haphazard press article about these issues, which unfortunately they are also restricted to, as all people in, are in the media, uh, to very, very heavy deadlines with a constant rate of writing, so that very few area experts. So I think um, I'm particularly pleased to be on this debate. I'm not particularly pleased to be on this debate given the situation the UK's in, however. I'm not here on the wings of victory. The fact is, um, in about three weeks, the United Kingdom is going to make um, a decision, or at least anyway, its telecoms um, supply chain review will finish. So that uh, is currently being carried out by two parts of the British government. Um, essentially, it follows from, um, as, as Representative Rogers mentioned earlier this summer, the uh, report that came out from the uh, over, overview, oversight board of the Banbury Center, which is, uh, you know, inside the center, they're constantly checking the code, constantly looking through Huawei uh, equipment. Uh, they are actually cleared by GCHQ, Britain's Signals Intelligence. So there, there is a le level of uh, oversight that I think is responsible. But at the end of the day, above all that is, you know, there's polit political pressure. Political pressure because of Brexit, political pressure because investment is badly needed. And so, although I am sure that the men and women inside the National Cybersecurity Center and DCMS and Ofcom are all doing their jobs, at the end of the day, someone who has to come in and make a decision on this has got to be A, someone who's not been influenced by China through their internet. It's got to be someone who has all the facts in front of them and someone who's not been pushed by only commercial means because it is a a question that involves every single one of us in this room and not merely businesses. So um, the sh short of it, and I'll try to run through this quickly, I think what I'll talk about very quickly is a brief overview of that British situation and why it's important to the Five Eyes Alliance and why Five Eyes to some extent is important. I may be singing to the choir. I don't know how much people are attuned to the Five Eyes. In terms of the British story, um, it begins in the 2000s with British Telecom essentially uh, ripping out all of its copper wires and going digital, and at that time um, being approached by uh, Huawei to, as one of the vendors 
uh, during the auctions. Uh, at that time, it went to cabinet office and a uh, situation was set up in which the Banbury Center in Oxfordshire was established. There was at the time no oversight board. And so the whole process had occurred essentially out of sight of ministers. Uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, who is a great friend to the Henry Jackson Society and, and a superb statesman, I think, and also a very strong friend of the Transatlantic Alliance, um, was impelled in 2013, 2012, 2013, to write his superb parliamentary report on that. I urge you to look at that in terms of like, if you want to dip your toe in supply chain security in the telecom sector. Essentially, it had all happened without real ministerial oversight and that you had a sense that in many ways the, the price angle had impelled the decision. And furthermore, there was no framework within government in which to say to, for example, British Telecom, you've signed a contract already. Well, we're going to have to ask you to unsign it. In which case, would the British government then be liable for lost revenues? So there was a very tricky legal issue in which the United Kingdom policy-wise was not ready for this situation. And I think that's true very much of the entire 5G conversation. And that's why I urge more think tanks, more researchers, more academics to really start talking about this so that policy can lead to better legislation. So following um, the 2013 report by uh, Malcolm Rifkin and the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee, we then had the Oversight Board and, and as has already been mentioned um, by myself and Representative Rogers. The recent, this summer's report came out and pointed to real issues. Um, and just to put it, make it clear, China was not accused of uh, nefarious activity. What it was accused of was consistently bad code, consistently, and that also consistently not giving uh, data on what was in their uh, structural products, their hardware products, their, you know, What's what's on the tin? You know what's what's inside the packaging. So often, when you get these components, you'll have at least for many uh, carriers, uh, you'll have an idea of what exactly goes into it. Huawei is not providing that data. So that at some point, the British decided they were going to push very hard on this, and there were very very stern discussions with Huawei representatives at Banbury Centre, which then pushed back very strongly. And when they pushed back, the UK government said, "All right, thank you very much for coming." However, having said that, we are in a Brexit period, in a period when British politicians and the British public are concerned. We're adrift from the continent politically. We know that the, the, the lack of the market access is coming. We're drifting towards the Indo-Pacific, which has been something that I've been working on a little bit in order to find if that you know, presents us with alternatives in terms of market access. So Huawei is very cleverly plugged into this by promising more uh, investment, up to $2 billion. If we just you know, go with things as they are, they insist that all the changes that the UK government want uh, would require five years and maybe $5 billion in, in costs for themselves. And where is that money going to come from? So um, anyway, I'm working on something that will, go in, will feed into the parliamentary debate uh, in the next three weeks, which is why I look like I haven't slept much. Uh, <laughs> So the questions I suppose that um, I would like to pose, uh, and it's not just to the panel here or people in the audience who might know better than I, um, but it's, it's certainly questions that are driving the shape of my research at the moment is, so, you know, is 4G even potentially mitigatable? Um, were the Brit British, con you know, kidding themselves? Uh, you know, we had Catherine Wheelbarger, the acting assistant secretary of defense in a recent hearing uh, on March 12th say, you know, she could see no way that 4G is actually mitigatable. So, okay, that's one question. That's like the current situation. So 5G, um, to what extent is 5G again, as was described by Representative Rogers, going to be mitigatable? Can we mitigate it really to have the actual architect of the system to be malign? Is it a case of the, you know, asking the fox to defend the hens? You're like, oh no, he's a great fox, very reliable. You know, he digs under fences, really great. We'll put him in there. So the, the question of, of nefariousness, which to some extent, I think there's a big debate about Huawei. Um, one of the things that we didn't mention is the Africa Union hack. Um, so I'm tracking a little bit of like the hacking stories on Huawei. And actually there are stories out there. The, the Africa Union one, you know, actually Aspie in Australia have done some really good work on this. The fact is um, Le Monde France, Francais uh, published a very good review of that. 
they went in, cleaned out the bugs. They stopped what was apparently a ZTE and Huawei server from essentially sending out uh, huge amounts of data every night at 2 a.m. Um, they stopped all that. And then, of course, they just went silent about it. The African Union don't want to talk about it. Why not? Well, gosh, you know, they're reliant heavily on Africa for infrastructure and investment. So this is one of the things that it seems, and I can't say with any kind of proof, but it seems that Huawei is very good at being a tool of the Chinese state and in the sense that it's part of the packaging, that if if they wish they can bring out the, the heavy PR machine, they can also put on the table huge amount of investment, and even worse, they can take that off the table, as they did during the Hinckley Point debates with the United Kingdom when they uh, threatened to take five billion off the table if Theresa May asked them for a security review. How dare she? But having said that, the Africa Union, the Australian uh, report uh, that they have done on a hack, which I think is, is worth looking at. Um, and there's a third party country that Australian intelligence, is, the ASIO, has written about. They will not publish that, I think, out of respect for that third country, which has a very heavy dependence on China's economy. However, I urge you to look that up as well. But having said that, is it not a red herring to chase the smoking gun? Is it not a red herring to say, They've done it here, they've done it there. Is it more sensible? And this is a question I'm grappling with, and, and I think to some extent Dean has brought it up and, and, and others. Is, is Huawei, it doesn't matter whether they've been caught or not, are they going to do it anyway because of the context in which they sit? They are a national company, not just of China. If it was a democratic China, whatever, I would be fine with it. But a China that under Xi Jinping is pushing forward political power of the party that is consolidating state-owned enterprises and their role in the state economy that is pushing more interference and influence campaigns abroad. So it's it's not just that it's Huawei, it's Chinese, and it's foreign, and therefore we can't like it. I think it's the nature of China, the host of the company. Of course, we can say Google and Facecom, uh, Facebook and Amazon do these things. But in a, at the end of the day, you know, you can catch them. You can you can call them out legally. You can have them, you know, come up the hill and and testify. You know, one of the things that we've heard a lot during this Huawei debate is, well, what about Snowden? Well, yeah, but that's actually Snowden's a great example. You know, he's he's someone who has brought a, a debate out in public, whether for good or for evil. There is no Chinese Snowden because the moment anyone said anything, they'd be immediately liquidated. So. I think to some extent, liberal democracies should also remember that the fact that we look so leaky, although it's terrible, <laughs> is also a sign um, that we do have that internal debate, that there is transparency and accountability. I end, uh, I'm probably dragging it two minutes over, with just a kind of reassertion of the importance of the Five Eyes to uh, the US. You know, Having lived in the UK, been in, in Whitehall for many years, you know, the amount of interoperability that we have is unbelievable. You have to see it to believe it. The fact that there are American servicemen walking around the Ministry of Defense, Canadians in the FCO, that I can go to the Pentagon and have a meeting and chat with an Australian, that we work so well together as, as five liberal democracies. Yes, we have Anglo-Saxon roots, but we're all, you know, multicultural now. We're all fairly uh, pluralistic and open. So I think it's one of those great, uh, intelligence alliances that really does form the backbone of NATO. And I think it would really be indefinitely in China's interest to subvert and uh, fragment that. And it's certainly not in our interest. So I, hope, I do hope whatever the British decision is that we work with the British rather than throwing people out, that we work with them, with the Australians to persuade them on future directions. And with that, I'll give up. Thank you. So I'm going to try to address three specific points. Uh, the first point is I want to engage directly uh, some, I think, understandable public skepticism as to the relative importance of this issue. Uh, it's, it's popular right now in this time of innovation to constantly, almost daily, be hearing about world-changing technological advances. And you're told that the, uh, the iPhone 8 is going to be categorically different than the iPhone 7S was, and it's going to change your life in ways that you never imagined. And then we get the iPhone 8, and we play with it, and we go, yeah, yeah, yeah bigger screen, feels good, not categorically different. And we as a culture uh, are, have been conditioned uh, to this type of uh, a, a dulling of our sensitivity to innovation because innovation just feels so normal now. 
Uh, I want to recognize that. And I want to also understand why that is a defining context in terms of the general population's understanding of these issues, and even to a degree to the men and women working on uh, Capitol Hill as to how they understand this issue. issue, this issue. Um, I also want to kind of poke a hole in that balloon, though, because I, I don't think that that is actually the best understanding of this situation. I don't think that we should be lulled into a type of complacency simply because the, the vocabulary of innovation is, is so um, hyperbolic all the time. Instead, I would say that when we talk about having 10 gigabyte per second access on our mobile phones, what that means is, is that is 600 times faster data speeds than what you currently get on 4G. That is 10 times faster than the broadband Wi-Fi that you experience in your home. So we're talking about exponential change here in terms of not just how quickly you can download a movie, but into the actual types of data that can be collected and commingled and assessed in real time. Um, sensors that up until this point have not been put on these types of devices because they place too much of a burden on the underlying network uh, will be on here the type of uh, cloud compute capability that will be enabled by this type of network will allow this to do a type of computational activity in terms of like AI apps, like legitimate real AI apps that are currently unthinkable right now. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you and help you understand that, that 5G is not just a faster phone. It's the difference between the steam engine and the internal combustion engine. It is a categorical change and evolution in terms of ultimate capacity. And that is in part why um, you are hearing the urgency within the technical community, within the government's community, because this technical capacity is going to be an underlying capability that will enable a whole host of new innovations, many of which we haven't even begun to think about yet. So I think being lulled into a type of um, dismissiveness is, is the wrong, understandable, but ultimate wrong response to this. My second and third points are going to be simply looking at the national security concerns that the United States has in two different aspects. Uh, both of them important, both of them relevant, and both of them complementary uh, and, and uh, intermingling with the other. Uh, the first is uh, concerning the United States general uh, innovative posture and capability, our ability to compete in these emerging technology environments. Concerns about uh, China developing and deploying uh, 5G uh, wireless networks faster than us is because if Beijing meaningfully deploys 5G quicker than us, they will uh, also likely begin realizing the technological and innovation benefits of 5G before us as well. In other words, to the degree that China is able to field this technology and then begin innovating off of that technology in the ways that I've just been describing, they will begin to realize the benefits of that faster than we can. And that will not only affect their domestic economy and all the cool stuff that many Chinese, an increasingly large number of Chinese get to experience. Their lives won't just be made better. They won't just take better pictures. But that the society as a whole will begin doing interesting things, not just economically, but also militarily. So when we think about key technological advances like artificial intelligence, the lifeblood of AI is data. So China has a significant advantage just in the number of, of pure potential sources of data, just sheer numbers of people. On top of that, they have virtually an uncontested freedom of movement to collect that data. 5G technology will allow them to get that data and to then process that data, and then to exploit that data in ways currently unheard of and never before experienced. This will almost inevitably lead to really interesting innovations, some of which whose applications we will hate in terms of the imprisonment of their own people, the political oppression of others, but many of which we would want to mimic and, and have ourselves. And in fact, not just have ourselves, but actually be the chief exporter and provider globally around those things. We don't want to cede, the United States does not seek to cede its leadership in technology innovation to China, not just because you know, we don't like being displaced, but because we actually think that could be a net negative for the world, particularly as we understand how China tends to use their technologies. 
So we have a genuine concern about our overall competitive posture if we are unable to deploy 5G technologies in a way that, com that is competitive, if not superior, to China. But then the second aspect of national security is the specific um, issue that has been brought up by um, all of the speakers up until this point. And, that, and I'll refer to that kind of clumsily as the, the counterintelligence uh, threat, the threat of Chinese espionage over 5G networks. Um, he, why we're talking about Huawei is because Huawei is the only company on the face of the planet that can develop, field, and run an entire 5G network soup to nuts. They're the only ones. They literally have a 5G network in a box. And they're going to seek to deploy that to these states that are increasingly client states in Africa and, and elsewhere. Um, Huawei has been able to do this. Uh, that, that is a strategic realization of, uh, of an objective of the, the, the country of China. Huawei's R&D and operating costs are subsidized by the Chinese government, which has allowed them to offer a very good product at below market values. And our own free markets have allowed them to assume a driver's seat because they did offer a very good product more cheaply than we could get alternatively. And now they're in the catbird seat. And so when we talk about what we, you know, kind of baby bells or local telecom, uh, telecommunications companies here in the United States, significant portions of them have Huawei infrastructure. And so when the federal government comes to local municipalities and says, hey, listen, this is a problem, they rightly look back at the federal government and say, well, I can't afford to rip everything out and replace it. And by the way, you let them in there. And so we have a genuine problem. We have a genuine challenge. Um, Chinese companies in general, and Huawei in particular, are closely aligned with Beijing and are required by law, this is a quote from Chinese law, to quote, support, assist, and cooperate with national intelligence efforts. There's no out. There's no alternative. There's no pass. If the Chinese government comes to you and requests your information, requests your data, requests access to your pipelines and to your networks, the only choice you have is to comply. The Chinese government also can legally hack into any Chinese company that they want. So even if for whatever reason someone did put up a fight and declined the uh, invitation to comply and to help the Chinese government, the Chinese government is legally empowered to gain access through technical means to any network that is inside of China. And they will and they can. So regardless of whether you are convinced of Huawei's complicity or willingness to work with the government, mm -hmm. the simple fact is, is that they are a Chinese company operating in China whose data networks full, flow back into China, and therefore it is only safe to presume that the Chinese government will have access to that data. And so finally, because of the way 5G networks work, the previous divisions in previous generations of, of wireless networks between the core, the cloud, and the edge, uh, those are being erased. And that's part of the promise of 5G. Being able to do complex computing on the edge is what's going to enable all kinds of wonderful things. But the flip side of that reality is that any significant endpoint on any portion of the network can significantly influence or exploit virtually any other point on the network. So in the past, we've been able to maintain basic firewalls between edge components, cloud components, and core components. We were able to build kind of sandboxes. Well, that's all gone now. Those things are going to be intermingling. They're, the distinctions are going to be uh, almost irrelevant. And so what that ultimately means is, is that any hostile foreign agent that is able to gain access on the network doesn't really need a back door. So when the British government does a review of the hardware and the software, or when the Italians believe the assurance that they've been given that, no, 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 the hardware and software, it's, it's all good. We've taken a look. OK, so there's no back door. They don't need one. All they need is a legitimate presence on the network mm -hmm. so that they can then build out laterally from there. And so these are, these are kind of categories. Not only is the technology categorically different, 
But the security concerns are categorically different because the technology is so radically changing. And so what you're seeing, what this conversation is about and then the broader conversation in general, is you're seeing a nation like ours struggle with this reality, realizing the promise, wanting to realize the promise and mitigate the challenges, but then having to do so in a way that we previously have not been able to do. And so I think that's why you're hearing a sense of urgency, particularly within national security spheres. I think that's why you are, uh, you know, all of this is supposed to begin rolling out in earnest in 2020. It'll likely be a decade or so before we really realize all of this. But 2020 is not a long time for us to figure out our national telecommunications wireless infrastructure. That's not just going to happen. And so, again, I would urge us not to be lulled into a type of passivity just because we're, we're inundated with innovation talk all the time, mm -hmm. but instead to understand that this actually is a pressing problem that demands serious thought. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Very much. And to all our panelists, and um, before taking a, a question or two, just a um, remark on, on the debate about Huawei here in the U.S. and the state of the debate. And I think far too often I have seen this discussion or U.S. concerns about Huawei diluted with the charge that there is no smoking gun. Uh, this is something that Representative Rogers addressed and others here have, have talked about briefly. But I think it's worth actually drilling down for just a minute into this question uh, and, and these doubts that there's no actionable intelligence, that if, if the U.S. really had reason to believe Huawei was a problem, it would have shared the intelligence with us and with the world. Maybe this is just a witch hunt to keep China down, to stifle competition. First, you don't need a smoking gun to have very credible concerns about what Huawei might do in a 5G network. And that's because of the nature of China, what was discussed earlier, what Klan mentioned, because they have a national intelligence law that compels their companies to share intelligence with the Chinese state. Uh, uh, Elsa Kania at Sina said, Huawei could be exploited for intelligence purposes by the Chinese government with or without the government's, with the company's complicity. Mm -hmm. These risks are not just about Huawei, but rather are inherent to the system and the constraints within which the company operates under the authority of the Communist Party. The second reason you would have reason to be suspicious, even if Huawei were squeaky clean, is because China has, presents an unprecedented espionage threat. It's been clear for over a decade. This year, the director of the FBI said the Chinese counterintelligence threat is more deep, more diverse, more vexing, more challenging, more comprehensive, and more concerning than any counterintelligence threat that I can think of. He said, the number of economic espionage investigations that the FBI is pursuing has doubled in recent years, and almost all of them lead back to China. So there's a very persistent threat from any Chinese firm in the telecoms industry. I think it would be reasonable to be extra cautious, extra wary, if they were squeaky queen. Is Huawei squeaky clean? Well, no. The record suggests it isn't. And in part, we don't have a fully clear picture of its record because, as Representative Rogers shed, there is sensitive intelligence that they cannot share with us. Um, there are examples of Chinese espionage that remain classified. I've seen them. I know them to be true. There shouldn't be any question that there are clear links to the Chinese intelligence services. This was the person who led the Commerce Department's uh, review of national security and espionage concerns, concerns related to high technology trade with China, Dr. James Lewis, who's now at CSIS. Even with uh, our lack of access to that sensitive classified intelligence, what do we know in the public realm? Well, we know that the U.S. has been grappling with this challenge for over 10 years. It was in 2008 that the Obama administration and the U.S. Congress effectively blocked the sale of U.S. software company to Huawei on national security concerns. In 2010, they prevented Huawei from supplying telecoms equipment to Sprint Nextel on national security concerns. In 2011, the U.S. Commerce Department banned Huawei from participating in LTE networks over national security concerns. 2014, it was banned from U.S. government contracts. This goes back over 10 years we've had these concerns. And it's not just the U.S., by the way. 
Australia, Japan, several European governments have independently taken a look at this question and independently concluded that this company poses major national security concerns and should be restricted from access to certain networks. The Pentagon has concluded that Huawei maintains close ties to the People's Liberation Army. The Department of Defense won't even allow Huawei phones to be sold on U.S. military bases. The U.S. Department of Justice referenced earlier, uncovered an internal Huawei memo that the company was offering bonuses to employees who succeeded in stealing confidential information from other companies. Just this year, and I'll end on this note, just in January, the FBI raided Huawei San Diego's office. It was involved in a scheme to steal IP tech from US firms. Poland arrested two Huawei employees charged with spying. A grand jury in Seattle alleged 10 federal crimes were committed by affiliates of Huawei, which FBI Director Christopher Wray said Huawei intentionally and systematically sought to steal valuable IP from American companies and gain unfair market advantage. It outlines how they snuck into a T-Mobile lab, directed employees to take photos, measurements, and other protected information, and finally tried to steal a robotic arm. Again, not squeaky clean. Secret intelligence reports given to Australian officials outlined a case in which Chinese espionage services used Huawei staff to get access codes to infiltrate a foreign network. The company officials were pressed upon to provide password and network details that would enable China's intelligence services to gain access. And last but not least, the founder of Huawei, Ren Zhengfei, started his career in the Chinese military reportedly serving as director of the People's Liberation Army Information Engineering University, which trains PLA technical specialists in cyber attack and defense. With that, uh, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. I was um, originally told we had the room till 12. We now have it until 11.30 uh, to make room for another group. So we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Back right. Thanks. I want to thank the panel for all the, the information that you've um, given us. Here in the U.S., as probably elsewhere, the, the debate is framed as whether or not we should allow Huawei to um, provide components for building the, the 5G network. But given Huawei's ubiquity in the current network, the existing network, and the um, interconnectivity globally of the network, um, it, it would seem to me that whether or not Huawei provides components now is sort of beside the point in terms of security. That is, they're already in the network. And unless we build a closed network or rip out all of the current Chinese you know, components, I don't understand how we get to that security. Well, I, I'd turn that over to the panel. I, I think part, part of that was addressed briefly in, in saying that some of these countries are now 50% Huawei equipment, and they face a very significant challenge in trying to rip things out and go back, but that here in the U.S., we're not quite in that type of scenario, that they haven't been allowed to come in en masse like that, and maybe they represent 2% of the system. But, Colin, do you have a... Well, in, in one sense, I think I think the point is correct um, that um, to to kind of use Dean's framing of a of, a, of an information pandemic, um, we're not guaranteed not to get infected no matter what we do. I mean, it, it it could be a problem. That being said, there is something to be said about trying to keep the infected body as far away from you as possible, rather than hugging it all the time. Um, and I think that is the balance that the U.S. is trying to find. Now, while I want to talk, while I, I'm in, in my conversation, I mentioned how a significant presence on the network could have influence over the broader network. That's true. Um, but the U.S. 5G network, it's not, it's not the intranet itself, right? It, we're, we're talking about the, the kind of infrastructure. And so it's not actually right to assume that our 5G internet necessarily touches every other international global 5G internet 
Um, and that's actually a manageable, excuse me, that's a, that's a, that's a manageable exchange that, that we, can, we can handle. But the broader concern about the potential of, a, of an informational pandemic is precisely why you're watching the United States engage its allies, and particularly its Five Eyes allies, um, as aggressively as they are. Because they realize that this interconnectivity and the sharing uh, that we have grown accustomed to and that frankly is necessary for, for modern national security um, poses a significant risk when any uh, participant uh, in the Five Eyes exchange um, is potentially decisively compromised. So um, the short answer then is yes, you're never really going to escape at all. But no, that doesn't mean that you should just stop caring and kind of throw your hands down. Another question here. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, my name is Nawaz Aoyama from uh, Japan's newspaper, the Asahi Shimbun. I want to put a question from an ally's perspective. Uh, two questions. So uh, I agree uh, the Huawei threat is real, but uh, President Trump has occasionally implied that, that uh, the criminal justice uh, or enforcement issues surrounding Huawei uh, with the US trade uh, with US China trade talks I was wondering if uh, this approach of the president could uh, undermine the rule of law uh, due process of law uh, which is really the cornerstone of democracy which is really the uh, greatest comparative advantage of the United States to China. Uh, this is one question. And and the other is, uh, so again, um, uh, President uh, Trump uh, praised uh, dictators, very authoritarian style dictators, and castigated uh, its uh, democratic, the US democratic allies. So there is, I, I think, a legitimate level of concerns about the US commitment to, to its allies, uh, maybe both in Europe and in Japan. So what do you think is the key to keep China from exercising its long-standing uh, strategy to play uh, one country off against another? Uh, John, why don't you go ahead and explain President Trump's strategy? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. No, no, no. How about the Allies one? There you I go. thought that was more my, my Perfect. tea. Um, I think on the Allies one, yeah, I think it's... What, you know, don't try not to use a hammer with us is, is the, the most obvious one. You know, was it, we have to pay to have U.S. troops on your soil type of thing. All that stuff goes down really well in Europe, of course. Um, I, I actually agree with some of the, well, actually completely with the 2% NATO debates. I absolutely think it's um, just from a political science perspective, non non-functional for the one partner to pay 70% of defense and the others, all of them combined to only 30. Um, but there's a way to do it. There's a way to have the conversation in terms of how the five eyes can go forward. You know, I think we need to really institutionalize a our, our sharing of intelligence on telecom and national security much more than we already do. I know we're already heading that direction, but it needs a, a, a power push. And certainly partners like Germany and Japan should be a part of that to some extent. And I also do think that, you know, what Malcolm uh, Turnbull said in, in London last week at, at my uh, society is absolutely true. How have we come to the state where no Five Eyes country has a 5G provider? We need to turn that around. And I don't know if F-35 is probably a bad example of what countries can do, but I'm sure between the five of us and perhaps countries like Japan, we could, within uh, a short space of time, turn that around. And, uh... Final question. My name is Hans Morris from German National Public Radio. Um, as Congressman Roger said, and I find that astonishing, there is no American company that can provide a 5G network. Does that mean that the American industry companies were caught asleep at the wheel? And the second point, what is the solution, the practical solution? At least there are two European companies I know who can provide the network, which is Ericsson and Nokia. So why isn't there a joint approach to say, let's put these companies into competition and, and, and make some offers? And the third question is, as economic espionage is not something new. I mean, the Americans have been spying on, in Germany. Or the Russians have been spying in Germany everywhere else. Chinese have been spying and even bought KUKA, which was mentioned. So um, I think is, isn't the real problem more or less the new dimension we're approaching? I think Mr. Uh, 
Kitchen, you, you mentioned that. 5G means in combination with quantum computers, artificial intelligence, and a few other things, cloud computing, that we're getting basically a new ecosystem. And uh, is that actually the right approach, just to jump into it at high speed, which 5G obviously means? Or isn't it about time to reflect first before we build the whole system, also with the Internet of Things and 50, 60 billion gadgets that are supposed to be connected within the next 15 or 20 years? And therefore, are we having the plate, so to speak, too full? Thank you. Uh, so there was a threefold question, like three and a half fold question. I'll do my best to engage as much of that as possible. Um, one one point um, that you may contest: um, the United States government does not conduct economic espionage. We don't. We are legally prohibited, and we we observe that rule of law. Um, unlike even some of our European allies. Um, two, in terms of um, the U.S. or our European allies not having uh, domestic equivalents of, of Huawei. Uh, a, a couple of things. Um, one, it's not that we lack the technical capacity. We absolutely can. And I like the idea that, that John even mentioned in terms of the Five Eyes. If we get uh, the fire lit underneath us, I think we may be able to pull something together. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the conversation going on right now. As to why we find ourselves here to begin with, um, I think there's a, a number of reasons why that has occurred. Uh, one, um, outsourcing portions of network development to uh, foreign developers, particularly in China, has been the cost-effective way to do this. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Chinese companies, Huawei in particular, has been subsidized. They have also conducted a systemic IP theft capability that has allowed them to leap over the prohibitive costs of R&D uh, they steal the IP, they build a domestic uh, equivalent, and then they sell it on the cheap because it's subsidized by the government. Um, well, our market has migrated to that cheap, good enough option. And I fault, in, in part, our, our governments in not engaging more deliberately and more effectively in seeing around the corner some of the necessary, I mean, at this point, the, the inescapable conclusions that you would have to draw in terms of how that leaves you vulnerable. In, in an information age, the, the networks and the pipes that carry information, that's critical. Um, we've seen this, though, in, in our industrial control systems. So five weeks ago, the Director of National Intelligence testified publicly before Congress that both China and Russia have the current capacity to disrupt critical infrastructure for weeks. And in a just-in-time economy, that, that equals a lot more than just you know, flickering lights. That's a catastrophic problem. And in part, that is because much of the security around those industrial control systems have been offloaded to the companies themselves. Now, part of this, in terms of your fuller plate question, um, why don't we just kind of stop and think about this uh, before we do it? Uh, there's, there's two aspects. One, even if the United States did do that or our Western nations did do it, there's no way that China would. I mean, you're talking about a country that does human biological te tech experiments. I mean, they're, they're, they're experimenting on their own people as to organic night vision and CRISPR technologies are being employed in human genome testing. Like, so they're, they're just not going to be constrained whether we kind of are constrained or not. Uh, and then also, too, we, one of the reasons why the U.S. and the West in general ha has had the dynamism that we've had is because we have a permissionless innovation environment. No one has to and no one should have to ask the government for permission to pursue new opportunities and to develop cool stuff. The problem is, is that that innovation, that, dyna that dynamism has a cost. And we're starting to realize that as we have innovated faster than we can secure. Yeah, sure. Just a gentle pushback as well because, you know, Germany is quite a significant economy in its own right, fourth or fifth. Well, why is there no German version. Well, why did Germany only set up a, a cyber command in 2017? I mean, to some extent, we've all have got to pull this together. And so I do think it's important that you point out the American weaknesses, but also, you know, Germany is an advanced economy. Why are we not, why are we looking to the Scandinavians? So I do think a bit of self uh, analysis would also be good in your piece that you write. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And it's driven by the auto industry, which wants to have uh, 5G in the cars as quickly as possible. Anyway, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Well, this, is, <laughs> this has been great. I am um, consistently in all of these guys. Uh, who, who do such good work on, on, on national security and tech and 5G. I'm really thrilled with how the presentations turned out today with the remarks by Representative Rogers. This is a deeply consequential issue that is not going anywhere anytime soon. And I like to think that Heritage is going to be staying on top of this in the years ahead. So, so tune in because we'll be back. Thank you all. Mm. Thank you.